Hello, welcome to the show. The building behind me is an Adelaide Hills landmark with a very interesting past and now an exciting future as well. More on that later. First, here's a look at what else is in today's show. We'll show you how to kick goals in the kitchen with Callum's Fast Footy Food. And we take a look at what's on right around the state. But first, here's Michael. Have you ever stopped to think about how our gardens have evolved over time and where certain plants originated from? Well, today, I've come to the Mount Lofty Botanic Garden to check out their collection and find out more. Rob, these are beauties. Tell me what's so special about them. Well, these are Douglas firs. They're some of the oldest plants in the garden. They eventually get to about 300 feet in size. Rob Hatcher is the curator here, and there's not a plant in this place he isn't familiar with. But that wasn't always the case, when plant exploration and introduction pushed an exciting new frontier. What would the early plant hunters look for a tree like this for? What would they use it for? A lot of those people went out looking for things that were of economic benefit, so they would have looked at the timber. Um, the guy that discovered the Douglas fir was David Douglas, you know, and uh, it's not named after him, but the common name, Douglas fir, has stuck, and also the Sitka screws behind us as well, another one of his. Back in the day, the plant hunters were not just botanists, but they were adventurers and explorers. They had to be made of tough stuff as they ventured to the far-flung corners of the world to collect plants of potential economic value. That's correct. I mean, the, the whole of the British Empire became so great because of all those introductions of the plant hunters, mm. including sugar, tea, all of those sorts of plants. The list goes on, doesn't the it? The list goes on. Mm. The majority of our collection has come from cool temperate parts of the world, like China, Japan, Taiwan, North and South America, and New Zealand. Now, Rob, we've got a couple of beautiful trees here. The Yemena sequoia. They have a story themselves, uh, you know, formerly only known as a fossil, found in a Chinese temple introduced into horticulture back in the sort of late 40s, early oh, 50s. Really? So, yeah, and uh, supported by a whole range of plants. Mm -hmm. Japanese maples and of course the, the ginkgo, well known as probably the first tree. The plant hunters were often employed by the gentry and organisations that sent them out. But their practices weren't always above board. Not all the time. Shonky there was some pretty shonky work that went on. Joseph Hooker got incarcerated in Sikkim, uh, which is one of the reasons why the East India Company went in there and that became part of the Commonwealth. So uh, there was uh, what you might call some interesting politics. Well, Robert Fortune was the person in question that stayed out for years trying to steal the tea plants from That's right. China. Yep, and got himself into all sorts of it's... hot water with mad monks chasing him and running barefoot through bamboo and getting all sorts of injuries. People had really, really hard times when they were out there. There are so many great stories to tell about the plant hunters. It would truly give Indiana Jones a run for his money. The most famous though, the one that cost several South American countries their fortunes, was the stealing of the rubber plant. The rubber plant. The local people used to produce the rubber. It was taken by the Brits. Malaysia became a big producer of rubber. That was part of the reason why the Japanese tried to get in there. It is a really, really big story about plants in the world. Now, if you'd like to know more about this fascinating topic, why not join Rob this coming week for a plant hunter's tour of the Mount Lofty Botanic Garden. Simply jump on their website to book. Or why not just come for a visit to see the last throes of autumn? It really is a glorious sight. So next time you visit a beautiful garden like this or even your own garden, just spare a thought for those plant hunters. For our gardens today would certainly not look the same without them. Coming up, meals to make in the half-time break. Footy season is my favourite time of year, and a great way to enjoy the action is to watch it on the big screen with your mates. But what about the food, and how do you keep it healthy? Hi guys, this is Themis. Now mate, I have to ask you as a dietitian, mm -hmm. is healthy footy food an oxymoron? You know what, I don't, I don't think it has to be. Um, the biggest question we probably actually have to ask is, is a snagging white bread actually food at all? Um, I think that we can definitely whip up something that is delicious, nutritious, and that everyone's going to enjoy in front of the big game. Perfect, well, in that case, let's get cooking. 
So the first dish we're gonna cook is ceviche fish tacos. And because there's no actual cooking in this dish, it could not be quicker and easier. What are you gonna do, mate? Well, I'm gonna get stuck into the little pineapple salsa. While Demis is getting on with our salsa, I'm gonna make a little kind of avocado puree. I want half a clove of garlic, some wasabi, a little bit of lime juice, and we're gonna give that a good old blitz together. Got a quarter of a cup of thick Greek yogurt as well. Now, with ceviche, there's kind of a couple of different schools of thought. Some recipes you'll find will say keep it for 10 or 15 minutes in the acid, which kind of cooks it effectively without using heat. Um, or you can kind of toss it together right at the last second. I know you and I both are a fan of keeping it nice and fresh. I'm using lime juice here, but lemon juice um, just as good. Whatever you like, really, whatever kind of acid it is gonna work here. We're using snapper, but whitefish, tuna, salmon, whatever's fresh, and your fishmonger says it's looking good. Cheers, mate. Good luck. <laughs> oh, you can taste that wasabi in there, it's delicious. <laughs> but I think that bit of heat is nice because the salsa, pineapple, the cucumber is really refreshing. So it actually is a, a really nice combination. It clears out those nostrils <laughs> so you can cheer loudly for your team. So the next dish we're gonna do is a beautiful flat iron steak and a chimichurri sauce. I tell you what, I think this is absolutely, it's pretty healthy, but it's absolutely full of flavor. This is our flat iron steak here. Um, we're just gonna rub it with a little bit of ground cumin. Just gonna impart a really lovely, savory flavor. Goes straight in, just as delicious. In fact, I love a little bit of marbling through here. It works really, really well in this dish. And that is a really nice quick cooking cut yeah. too. Definitely, this is like a half-time break kind of dish. Absolutely. <laughs> To make the chimichurri sauce, Demis chops up fresh parsley, adds red wine vinegar, anchovies, some cumin, and a good slug of olive oil. It's maximum flavor with minimum effort. All that's left to do is slice the steak and add any accompaniment you want. We've chosen garlicky green beans and herb potatoes. And then some of our chimichurri over the top, what do you reckon? Very nice, mate, and we've used the beef here, but of course, a piece of fish. A bit of salmon with this would be lovely with that chimichurri. Or some roasted eggplant or mushrooms, we've done this before, delicious. I reckon that cooks of any skill level could prepare that, so please give it a go during your next halftime break. After the break, a fairy tale transformation for a hills landmark. Not often I get to do stories about transcontinental romance, grand follies, or a castle. But today I've got them all in one story. Welcome to Basket Range and to the manor. This Adelaide Hills estate dates all the way back to, well, not quite the Middle Ages, just 1935. But thousands of South Australians will recognise it as Camelot Castle a hugely popular wedding venue that hosted happy matches as far back as the 70s. It's been closed to the public for quite a few years, but after an intense renovation, has just reopened as the Manor Basket Range. And Adelaide's most elegant émigré, Max Mason, along with canine consort, Faux Shizzle, is lending his style to the venture in partnership with the new owners. To say he's enchanted is putting it mildly. I think that if you have a castle that looks like this, in a position that this is in the middle of Basket Range, arguably one of the most exciting wine regions in Australia, and only 25 minutes from the city, you can't fail but create the most magical space. I've yet to have anyone arrive at the place and not get it immediately that it is something otherworldly. The relaunched venue is adaptable to just about any festive occasion. The two large function halls are roomy enough for a good old Elizabethan feast. And everywhere you look, there are flourishes that give the place a fairy tale feel. If I had to pin down the look, it would be Manor House Melange, with just a touch of tongue in cheek. Though there's no permanent restaurant, the kitchen kicks into gear to add flavour to events and wines from the very on-trend Basket Range region will be available at a new cellar door. With all this in mind, there's a nifty solution if you and your friends want to party the night away without cabbing it back to the city. A dozen neat little retro units. 
They all have kitchenettes and living spaces downstairs, with each unit uniquely adorned by a different artist. Upstairs there's a bedroom and a pretty swanky bathroom. They provide an incredible opportunity to escape from the city, to find yourself in the middle of wine heaven and in the most beautifully dressed rooms with really special surroundings. The manor sits on six acres and its sculpture studded grounds are already attracting the professional style seekers. Weddings are back on, in the tiny copper top chapel or in the beautiful gardens. Which brings us back to the love story involving the original Lord of the Manor, who got this whole party started. Albert Pinchbeck was a realtor. He was an Englishman in the late 1920s. He fell in love with South Australia. He'd made a lot of money in the UK and was trying to persuade his loved ones to leave Warwickshire to move here. They laughed at him and said without castles, they wouldn't be leaving Warwickshire. So he built them a castle out of the very best sandstone in Australia and created Warwick Park. Now, despite all this, things apparently weren't quite castly enough for the missus. So Lady Pinchbeck came out and rumour has it that she laughed at the castle and said that that's not a castle, it's a plaything, and turned tail and went back to the UK. If it's true, it's a horrific story. If it's not true, it's a damn good story. <laughs> at first, my heart As evening descends and guests arrive to toast the new look manor, it's hard to believe Lady Pinchbeck could have turned down a home in the hills like this. Perhaps a moat would have got her over the line. But if you fancy playing Lady or Lord of the Manor Basket Range, you can check for upcoming events on Facebook or the website. Music, theatre, history, fashion, perhaps even a ghost story or two. So now she's got her makeup on, she has her best dress on, and by damn, she's going to party. Next, what's on this winter, plus the wonders of Mount Gambier. Now that the cooler weather is here, there's always that temptation to stay rucked up at home. But let me assure you, there's still plenty of reasons to get out and about. The History Festival is in full swing. So if you haven't already delved into SA's fascinating past, you've still got plenty of time to check out some wonderful collections and exhibitions. Nature lovers rejoice, the whale watching season is here. Head south towards Victor Harbour for the best vantage spots. Check the SA Whale Centre website for regular updates and sightings. Now speaking of the sea, the Sea and Vines Festival is on again this June long weekend. So why not get involved in the largest wine region celebration in South Australia? This year's program includes more than 50 events across 28 venues, from intimate long lunches, chef's table demonstrations and wine flight masterclasses. Take my tip though, many of these events are ticketed so you can't just roll up on the day. So be sure you jump on the website to check out all the details. Oh, and hey, why not get a group of friends together and make a day of it? And for all you foodies out there, make sure you secure your tickets now to Dinner in the Dark. Heighten your notions of taste and smell by tucking into a four-course degustation menu blindfolded. It's a unique experience for an excellent cause. Can do for kids. And for those of you that simply want to burn off a bit of energy in the great outdoors, get ready for the Melrose Fat Tire Festival held in the beautiful southern Flinders Ranges. Just a few ideas to help you get out and about. And remember, if you do head along to any of these events, be sure to tag us on your social media as we love seeing you enjoying this beautiful state of ours. Hi, my name's Jan. I run Engelbrecht Cave in Mount Gambia, where we offer fully guided tours. We are literally three minutes from the hub, from the CBD. A lot of the people in Mount Gambia are unaware that they're living on top of caves. We offer fully guided tours down into the cave where we explain the history, the geology and also a little bit about cave diving because we're also a cave diving site. So we're 26 metres underground and this here is what's left of our underground lake. It feels special. The further down you go, the more tranquil it becomes. The sound of the city just disappears and this peace just 
it just envelops you. It is truly a natural wonder. Hi, my name's Jared. I manage the Mount Gambier Hotel, beautiful old hotel on the main street, on the main corner. Perfect place to come visit. It was built in 1862, so yeah, it's been here for a while. <laughs> Most of our food on the menu is local produce, locally sourced from around the area, same as the wines, a lot of Coonawarra wines. The restaurant side of it, we've gone that next level. Steaks is one that we take a lot of pride in. We've got a Josper oven, a you know, charcoal oven to cook. It's a different flavour, obviously treats the meat a lot better. We also have accommodation with uh, 16 rooms, you know, king size beds, double glazed windows. They've kept the old look to some of the rooms with new modern features like you know, new bathrooms. Mount Gambier is a lovely place to live in or to visit. Everyone knows everybody. You walk down the street and people know your name before you even know them. <laughs> but yeah, it's a great community. I couldn't fault it. My name is Tony Varinas and I'm from Metro Bakery and Cafe. And from my family to your family, welcome. The word metro, rather than it meaning for us city feel. It comes from the Greek word metrio, which means meeting place, community, and that's kind of the spirit that drives our vision. I'm Sicilian and my husband's Greek. We're Italian and Italian food is loud and it's messy and we reach across the table from each other and, and we talk. So that, that's the atmosphere. The year before last we won best breakfast in the state and best bakery and patisserie in the state, then went on to Sydney and we won gold for our bakery and patisserie. As soon as you walk in the door of our business, I want you to feel the same level of hospitality that I would give my family or my friends who came home to my house. Well, it's the beginning of a new era in Basket Range, but sadly the end of our show for today. Don't worry, we will be back.